Today's episode of Mark Who 42's Hooniverse is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash Mark Who 42. There are over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, you lucky guys. That's www.audibletrial.com slash Marku42. And now, here's the show. Hi, this is Anna Van Hope, and you're listening to Marku42. Christian Basil, present and ready, sir. Let's get this going. Patty Hawkins, uh, well, okay, well, yeah, all right. I'm not going to stand in Christian's way. <laughs> <laughs> and Iggy Matthews from Let's Be Real. How's it going, everybody? Hi, Iggy. How's it going? It's going. It's going. And I'm here. It's yeah. Enough without me. Yeah, we're here. Just to let you know, uh, guys, if you are watching Class, we do a bonus podcast called Class in Session. The first two episodes have already come out. We've reviewed the first half of the season, and you should check it out on iTunes and all the podcast places around the net. Just thought I'd put that in there. I do not appear on that segment. Yeah, you're not on that segment (laughs) because you're not in, you didn't enjoy it. You're not watching it. He's the dropout, honey. He just. I am. Oh, no, I'm not dropped out. I'm playing hooky. There's a big difference. Oh, you're playing hooky. That's true. He was never in. He, yeah, he, he big was difference. You know, when you, you, you drop out of something when you flunk out completely. You right, know, playing right, hooky right. is, uh, hey, I end this scene, daddy-o. Well, well so far, Iggy is head of the class, but Christian is doing well. Christian has an A average Unfortunately. Well. I want to flunk that class, actually. I <laughs> I need to put the dunce cap back on and wear yeah, with we, pride. Yeah, we put the dunce cap on you next time. You, you got an A, but dunce cap, that's how the education system works in America. You can have a dunce cap and still get an A. It, it's mind-boggling. This week's show is going to be a very special show. We've got Anna Van Hooft, who was in Sci-Fi Channel's Flash Gordon series. She plays Princess Aurora. She's been in Fringe. She's been in Cedar Grove. And... Recently, she was in the Warcraft movie as a Lonel, and many other things, and you'll learn about that in the second half of the program. But first, let's go to... Christian Basil and the Doctor Who News. Hey, gang. Well, I guess I'm in the news ghoul this week. Um, the news all the ghoul. News... It was the just ghoul? Halloween. It was just Halloween, so you could be the news ghoul. Oh, where are you talking about Halloween 2020 at Walmart? So um, <laughs> they've already got the Valentine's Day stuff out. I believe All it. the news that's brought to you today is brought to you by MarkWho42.net. If you want to continue the conversation and check out all these articles even further and want to read more, Go to markwho42.net and our Facebook page, markwho42. So without further ado, here we go. All the news I'm going to be presenting today are news that we uh, mentioned before, but we're getting a little bit more on the update side of this. Of course, unfortunately, Doctor Who Experience in London is scheduled to close the summer of 2017. Damn, I, I was thinking that thing would be around forever. But we've been kind of quietly talking about The possibility, because of the closure of the experience, they're making way for the new theme park, which is opening 2020. What do you guys think about that? That sounds like I would be looking forward to the TARDIS ride. Yeah, yeah. That's what that sounds like. You think the TARDIS is a free fall? It'll be a TARDIS simulator. It'll probably be like Disney. It'll be a TARDIS (laughs) simulator. Oh, it's going to be like a blue roller coaster with your feet dangling no, out. No, no, and there's no, going to no. be the that's TARDIS the, sounds that, everywhere. That's the cyber coaster they're going to have. So it was all in your mind. I hate those type of movies. <laughs> and, and the Daleks are going to have like the Buzz Lightyear ride at Disney where you're shooting, where you're in a Dalek car and you're shooting people. 
Oh, so cute. Nice. Yeah, it's going to be a fun park. And, and, and I can't wait to go to Sherlockville and have tea at 221B Baker Street. Patty, can we make that happen over at Disney? What I would love to do is for us to purchase a Dalek, remove one of the cars from Buzz Lightyear, replace it with a Dalek, and just shoot things for points out there. And all he does is exterminate, exterminate, exterminate. Oh, you know what? Uh, Disney, they, they love doing parades. So imagine just a parade with Cybermen, you know, just... So, so Patty, can you make this happen okay. as the resident Disney guy? Uh, well, um... <laughs> He's over here like, in, in, the, in, 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 in the in the in the words of uh, my friend who works in Imagineering, who is running away to Japan for the next several years uh, to do rides out there. Um, yeah, in the United States, uh, unless it's Frozen, Star Wars, or Marvel, Disney wouldn't touch it with a ten foot pole. What's going on with this Avatar thing? Oh come on! <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh. Don't... <laughs> I mean, you know, now that uh, Ava- a new movie. Ava- Avatar is eighteen months, uh, like like overdue and seven hundred million over budget. Wow. Okay, Yikes. so so we're not looking to Avatar Land anytime soon. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Tune in for Mark who forty two after dark. Just... The problem, the problem, the problem, the problem with Avatar Land, quite frankly, was that the deal was set up as a knee jerk reaction to uh, Universal icing the deal with uh, Harry Potter. Which, incidentally, my friend in Imagineering was screaming at Disney, he's like, we need to get onto Harry Potter right now. And they're like, oh, no, 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 wait, that's just a fad, you know, oh, so, so much of that. But, um, yeah. so, execs were literally like, oh, well, we gotta, we have, hey, this Avatar is sci-fi thing, is the biggest movie of all time, so it must have a huge fan voice. And uh, the problem with that is, lots and lots and lots of people saw Avatar once. Not a lot yes. of people went back, saw it a second or third time. It's got no cult following. Um, you hardly ever see anybody cosplaying them at the shows. And they could just ask Mattel because they couldn't give those toys away. Gotcha. Wow. wow. So, so it was a one-time deal. That was it. I mean, it's something you see once and then we're done with it. I don't know. Yeah, more or less. I... And there's no doubt that the sequels will be successful. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a repeated viewing uh, sort of thing. Now, that being said, from what I've seen from my perspective of Avatar Land, it is going to be beautiful. The oh. uh, the new animatronic technology that they're developing for it is supreme and state-of-the-art and incredibly lifelike. But I, I, again, it's kind of like, wow, this this whole thing has been has been built maybe around something that was never meant to support it. Right. Okay. So exactly like the movie then. <laughs> <laughs> As a cast member, I can neither confirm or deny that. Uh, and then I think we'll leave it there. Can't with their tails. Anyway, uh, well, let me let me ask this question, and I want to pull everybody here. If they made Avatar two, do you think it will come back? There is no if they made Avatar two. He's doing Avatar two yeah. four all at once. But do you think it will make a comeback? Do you think it will finally start having the cult that it needs to for the for the theme park and and for the genre to survive? No, I think I I'll, I'll tell you why. In my own opinion, I think there's a, there's a disconnect between a human protagonist and the the the, the blue like Smurf creatures. Um, was that J.J. Abrams that directed that? No, it was James Cameron. <laughs> James Corden. I, you know what? James when it Corden. Comes to... James Corden. Yeah. No, not James Corden. James Corden. James Cameron. The late, James late Cam- show on CBS. Where are you getting James, James Corden from? Uh, NASCAR, probably. Gavin and Stacey fans, you can shoot Christian at the next convention he goes to. Thank you. What? <laughs> what? Did I say something? Yeah, and that's when it went all downhill. <laughs> so it's Pretty James much. Cameron who did this. Will he be directing all of that again? Or? Oh yeah, no, he that that's that's all he's been doing for the past. Oh, so like, that's his baby years. right now. Yeah, I mean he's he's been you know get like he did with Abyss and everything else. He takes the budget for these films and he actually invests it in pushing cinematic technology into new levels, which is great uh, on one sense. So he's blazing. He's bla- he's doing what ILM used to do. He's really blazing some new past technology wise, but he's funneling it into this crazy you know i'm not really quite sure okay so what the human's gonna come back again and we're gonna see some more you know hey you know sticks and stones against like like battle mechs but sticks and stones still wins i mean it's yeah 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 no it's 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 gonna be like once you have a story like this where it's uh you know good versus evil and it's always a battle i mean you can't do a sequel without basically repeating everything that you just yeah. saw in the first it, movie so and, and and also too to be perfectly frank um it's a big disconnect for me to root against my species um that's that's, that's, that's <laughs> that, that is 
is the problem I have with the Planet of the Apes movies. Because I'm supposed to root for the apes, and I, I just, I'm like, no, I'm sorry, I can't. Especially in a post-apocalyptic environment where it's pretty much us versus them. And I, I no matter how you slant it, I'm kind of like, eh, you know. But, but I, 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 like I, I joke around with this in my geek comedy act. I was just like, me rooting for the apes and the planet of the apes. It's like, leave it this way. In the 50s, you didn't see little Mexican kids wearing Davy Crockett hats. Oh! <laughs> But but you know what? On that note, Patty, I'd rather now go maybe they to... wore Santa Ana hats. That'd be kind of cool, you know. <laughs> I'd rather go to the Planet of the Apes ride than I would the Avatar ride, <laughs> if they had one. Speaking of what Patrick just brought up, have any of you been watching the new show on NBC called Timeless? Oh, that was pretty no. popular right <laughs> now. Because the last episode was at the Alamo. And I'm actually enjoying that show. It's nice to have another science fiction time travel show that is on when Doctor Who isn't that is actually pretty decent. You know, we've had crappy time travel shows at different stages of American television, but this one's pretty good. Rated on a scale of 1 to 5. On a scale from 1 to 5? Mm-hmm. Four. If you gave me a scale from one to ten, I'd say seven. I'd go a little below, like three and a half. Well, why are you going <laughs> below? What's missing then? Uh, I just kind of don't believe that the sh- <laughs> there are there's I, it, we could we could do a whole show on this. I, I'm just gonna put it that it needs a little tweaking. What's the show about? Besides okay. the usual, oh, we're back at this famous point in history, so we got to make okay, sure. Okay, basically, uh, there's this terrorist who has his hands on a time machine. Except he may not be a terrorist, but he's changing history to get to change the timelines to get rid of a certain person and or organization, and the U.S. government who thinks he's a terrorist is sending their agents uh, two of whom were civilians to stop him and basically kill him but the guy who is the terrorist or not the terrorist basically says you know he's getting all his notes from a diary from one of the people who are chasing him so it's a little convoluted uh, but the timeline keeps changing. There's an evil organization. Matt Frewer's in it, and uh, Max you know. Andrew. Yeah, Max Andrew. Well, I, I okay. Well, I do like Matt Frewer a lot. Yeah, so. yeah, and and you know, Wibbly, wobbly, they, they do a wobbly. red herring in the first episode with Matt Frewer, which if you know Matt Frewer's roles, you totally know. Okay, that's they're throwing you off. He gets kidnapped in the first episode, taken away by this guy, and you know he's working for him. You totally know that he's the one, but he's not evil. He's actually starting to realize maybe I shouldn't have done this, and it's a decent show. And the guy who pilots the time ship for the good guys is a black man, and they keep going to places like the Civil War and to the 50s, where he totally is in trouble because he's black. So they get a lot out of that. And, and, and racism oh, I'm and sure stuff. they do. It's a, it's a good show. It's a good show. So, in, in nice. short, this is government slash conspiracy slash public enemy number one slash wibbly wobbly. Yes. Yes. Wibbly That's wibbly. what the show is. And it's definitely something you can watch if you're needing some time travel fixing. You know what I've always wanted to see, and no one's no one's ever done this to completion, is I've always wanted to see, all right, somebody gets a time machine and starts shenanigans, and the protagonists have to stop them. But what if the shenanigans they want to do is, like, best of interest? Like, they completely want to, like, they think fix them. They want to go back in time, and they want to kill Hitler. And they want to stop the Japanese from bombing Pearl Harbor. And they want to help the Americans win the Alamo and stuff, right. thinking that well, this will make for a better country or something, you know? The woman who is a history professor who is going along with the good guys, she wants to make sure history is preserved. She doesn't want anything changed, and everything keeps changing. Ah, I've, I've thought they and what if, that. And what if you found what if you found out the halfway through that the history we know it were you know just those situations happened. Maybe they weren't supposed to happen. Maybe those happened because somebody from the future went back. Right, and, yeah. right, right. <clears throat> God, this is why I hate time travel stuff. So. Uh. Yeah. But I thought they've done that on other shows. I've seen that. Uh, um, on other shows that they it, not necessarily full series like time like this show, but other shows where they've done it once. Yeah, 
for an episode, and then they found out that changing history, they really screwed things up for the future. Yeah, there was actually a a movie, I forget the title of it, uh, but basically they go back in time and they killed a butterfly, and apparently that butterfly was very significant in (laughs) this dinosaur world. That movie. But I get that, I get that. It's just one little thing, and that was the domino we needed, so we could go left, now we're going right. Yeah, but one of the cool things about Timeless is that it has a Doctor Who connection. Oh, It does have a Doctor Who connection, because one of the gentlemen who's in it, Patterson Joseph, plays Connor Mason, and Patterson has been on Doctor Who, the new series. Patterson has played Roderick in The Parting of the Ways and Bad Wolf. Mm -hmm. So he was in Eccleston's first series, you know, so it's kind of cool that there is that connection. Cool. Yeah. I know. Saturday Night Live nailed time travel shenanigans the very best in the 80s, where scientist uh, Tim Kazarensky develops a time machine. I'm going to go back in time. I'm going to save Abraham Lincoln. And then he gets there, and he's like, oh, Mr. Lincoln, you got to come with me. And then some other people show up. Mr. Lincoln, we had come from the future, too. Excuse me, who are you? It's like, who are you? You know, we're from, <laughs> I'm from 1981. So, well, we're from the year 2020. You know? I it's, remember it's like, that. Okay. Yeah, and then John Candy shows up at the end. Like, Mr. President, I'm here to all. Oh, like, like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know. And there's a little bit of history in the show that you don't know. Is it real history? Did they make it up? Because, you know, they say certain things have to happen. And, like, I never learned any of that in school. That's so, yeah, it, it's just a fun show. It's a fun show. All right, all right. I might but give it back a look. to Doctor Who News. Cause back really, to Doctor Who News, yeah. And I, I, I've also forgot, uh, I didn't mention, but um, just, uh, Patterson Joseph has also premiered in the, I believe it's the fourth episode of Strangeness in Space. So he has that connection as oh, well. okay, cool. A show that we happily yes. sponsor there. Yes, yeah. I say, we're big, big allies of them. Yeah. Speaking of which, even though we're seeing the demise of the experience, there's a couple who we've had on the show before who are trying to rise from the ashes, a museum of all things, a Doctor Who merchandise museum, and it is on the Facebook site. I'm talking, of course, our friends Sam Stone and David Howe. David has written many non-fiction Doctor Who books, including the Celestial Toy Box, which and he runs uh, Telus Publishing, and he runs Celus Publishing, right. right. Uh, and his wife is a horror writer, but she's also written for some big finished Doctor Who stories in the short trips range. David and Sam have been to L.I. Who, and they recently started their campaign, which is on our uh, website if you want to check it out, markwho42.net. It's their Indiegogo page for the start of the Doctor Who Merchandise Museum. We've mentioned this on the show before. Yeah, we mentioned it last week, yeah. But uh, we are having plans to have them come back onto the show. We won't go into too much because they're going to come back and talk more about the museum. And I'm still an advocate to saying, Sam, David, I know the perfect spot if you want a U.S. opening. It's right on International Drive. It is just sitting right next to the Titanic Museum. That will be a perfect (laughs) spot. Unfortunately, Titanic is a fixed point, so there's nothing the doctor could do there. But anyway, that would be a nice fixed point, pun intended, on International Drive. (laughs) Doesn't Orlando have a big British population? I, I've i heard it. I, well, I haven't gone around and asked people, but I've seen people <laughs> who are from Britain in the area. I don't know if it's huge or not, but I, I there's have... a pretty big population there. Well, it, we, have, we have a lot of timeshares that uh, – so, yeah, you get, you get a lot, you get a lot of uh, Europeans, people from the U.K. coming over here on holiday. And as you truthfully know, I mean, you know, we as Americans, we all three day vacation and and Britain. No, they take holidays. So they're here for like three to four weeks. So that kind of and they're doing all living on the same timeshares and stuff like that. So we have a semi transitory British population. Okay, And we do have a fair amount of people that like stay or open up businesses and and, then stuff like that. So. Right. So, yeah, it's 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 here. You know, it, 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 it fluctuates constantly. Cool. But we do get a lot of tourists yes. coming in from the U.K. who come yeah. into the United States, and especially for Disney World and all the mm. theme parks out here. Mm. Uh, on a sad note, and Patty, I've got to add this, because personally I've read your take on this, and it was one of the most heartfelt takes that I've read about this. We've had a passing, not in the Hooniverse outside of it, but one that I think is very important, and to the geekdom world, we lost Robert Vaughn, the man from Uncle, passed away at age 83. This man has an IMDb and a list that goes on forever. 
Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's, I, as funny as it sounds, of all the stuff that he has done, the stuff I remember fondly because I grew up as a kid was Superman 3, even though we, everybody <laughs> detested that movie. <laughs> I, I I still thoroughly liked him. He wasn't he wasn't Lex Luthor. He had his own take on things, but I still liked him. And you know what? I I got to say it because I just like the movie because it's one of my um my uh what the, what do you call it? Your, your guilty pleasures? Yeah, um, oh, sure. Yeah. Basketball. Oh, that's just right. Because he wasn't he was basketball. There's, there's, there's nothing I like guilty basketball. about liking basketball. Basketball is freaking hysterical. It is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and I just. Well, every time Superman I Superman three is a guilty pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'll take that. I just, I, but I've always, whenever time I see uh, uh, Robert Vaughn in a movie, he makes it just ten times better than what it is. There's a purple thing about Vaughn. If you went back in time and removed him, we might not have had Star Trek. Because here's here's the deal. He 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 actually starred in Roddenberry's first series, The Lieutenant. Yes. And I think at the time the, he was thinking I early on Roddenberry was going to say, well, you know, he considered Robert Vaughn for the character of the captain and stuff like that. And that's what, again, the Desilu was like, well, we're going to get rid of Lieutenant, but what else have you got? And uh, so that's, yeah, he, he was, he was a small part in the, the creation of Star Trek, which, uh, you know, without Star Trek, probably none of us would be here. And then, of course, yeah, Man from Uncle, and a lot of people yeah. don't realize this. Man from Uncle was basically designed by Ian Fleming. You yeah. know, he got yeah, he got was. tapped on the shoulder by American. Right. Yeah. Hey, could you could you make an American uh, James Bond for us? And uh, here's a big bag of money. And it's like sure, because only Ian Fleming could come up with the name Napoleon Solo. That would exactly. be ridiculous. Yet somehow still works. <laughs> and, and yeah, it just goes on from there. And the Magnificent Seven, of course, he was the last of the Magnificent Seven to to leave us. And of course, if you haven't seen that movie uh or the sci-fi remake you know <laughs> uh battle beyond the stars where he played oh, the same yeah. character uh, with special ever... effects by <laughs> james cameron that movie actually made his bones that's what kind of got him uh in the roger corman you know that and uh galaxy of terror he did these special effects on and that's what led him to his directorial debut of piranha 2 the spawning but that's going a little deep the point is is that that Robert Vaughn had had a small part in a lot of the things that uh, that led to greater things that we enjoy right now. So he's definitely somebody. If you're not familiar with his work, then by all means, please respect that the the effect that he had and the greater effect. If you want to talk about the greater effect of time traveling, and and he was a butterfly that flapped his wings at the right time forty years ago, which brought us to this day. Did you ever see his BBC series Hustle? Actually, no, I haven't. No. I was going to leave you that to must. you because I bet you have. Yes, You're the, you yeah. must. You must watch Hustle. It is a great show about con artists, and it's just so good. And Vaughn, the only American on the show, is perfect. Yeah, and, I guess and, his wife was British, so apparently yeah, yeah. up until they passed, they would spend half the year in the UK and then half the year in the United States. Yeah, And let me add to this, to what Patty was saying. Because I'm I'm going back to my guilty pleasure, Su- Superman three. When I first saw it, I only thought about Richard Pryor because that's what the whole movie was trying to be about. It was trying to make this into a comedic thing. And later on, I started hating me. I said, "This is this is you know you can't compare this to one and two. There's nothing even remotely close. There's no Lex Luthor or anything." Today, when I see it. I see it for Robert than anybody else. Not for Richard, not for even Christopher. I watch it because Robert is on there. And I keep watching it, even if it's coming up on a TV show, uh, if it's coming up midway through a channel that I'm watching, I'll look it on just to make sure I keep watching Robert. Because I thought he was a cool... That's just me. I don't know if that goes for Another weird bit of trivia that I I, I didn't realize, because when I wrote my eulogy for him, I was like, look it up, Superman 3 and stuff. The blonde, uh, the blonde bimbo in that, that's Billy Connolly's wife. Yes. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, she, yeah, she, 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 she was from New Zealand, she retired from acting, and now she's a psychologist. Nice. Oh, working on Billy Connolly's psyche. <laughs> if well, that's what great. you call it now. She's also um, the woman from History of the World Part 1 where she has to hump the king. <laughs> it's good to be the king. It's good to be the king, so that's her. Wow. So. Right on. So, Robert Vaughn, wherever you are, we th- we love you, we thank you, and we'll miss you. And closing Channel D for the last time for him. Yeah. Anything else, Christian? Oh, yeah. We are moving on to another, uh, and we and I, I can just happily say that Iggy and I were very honored and 
Guys, keep an eye out for an upcoming episode with creator Fraser Cool and one of the co-stars, Ennis Anderson, for uh-huh. the series called Cops and Monsters, which is now co-starring with an episode with Sophie Aldred. But she's uh-huh. not the only alumni to be on this series. It also includes... Sarah Louise Madison. There you go. Ah. And Caitlin Blackwood. Make sure you visit their YouTube page and hit that subscribe button. They would really appreciate your support. And you yeah. can also get to the link from Marku42.net where we have a story specifically and a video of Sophie Aldred in character. So definitely yeah. want to check it out. They are still running a campaign to raise more funds to have more episodes. But Marku42 is now a proud sponsor and supporter of Cops and Monsters. This is a terrific series. you got to catch it on YouTube. You can just look it up by YouTube or just go to our site and click from there, whichever. Yeah. Mr. Cool, Mr. Cool is, in fact, very cool. Very cool. Very cool. A uh, lot of work that went into that one, and, you know, God, that was just an honor to be able to talk to the two of them. Very fun. Yeah. So that should be on in a couple of weeks, I think. Exactly. Sometime in December. Yes. It's a nice little Christmas package for everybody. Yeah. And just to wrap up some of the news that we've got, uh, if you'd like to go again to marku42.net, you can go to our reviews that Iggy and I are participating in class. We have our second bonus episode of episodes three and four. Uh, Definitely, definitely, definitely want to check out the the episode, our 160th episode of Legacy Continues uh, with Patty's interview with Vic Mignogna. Oh, it is that was really so good, terrific. Ooh. It premiered this week, but if definitely if you haven't had a chance, you can click on the link now, download it yourself. I, I took the episode to work, and I don't think I got any work done. I was too busy listening. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Patty. Yeah. Did you know that that episode that you did with Vic was actually the first episode in the fifth year of Mark Who 42. We just passed our fourth anniversary. No and that was episode one of season five. Woo! Woo! How exciting. Patty, take me I, fa- I thank my mama and Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's thanking Jesus. Uh, it's the in thing to do. Not the guy from The Walking Dead either. And also uh, our friend... Christopher Baggett, he did a review of the Conspiracy Torchwood Series 1, which stars John Bowerman, and I actually got a chance to purchase a CD from Marku42 Books and enjoyed it thoroughly. And it and has a we will be very posting, twisted... we, will, we will have the rest of the reviews for Torchwood Series 1 and 2 from Big Finish over the next coming few weeks. And I hate to say this, we haven't had really a chance to have the birthdays as much. So we're going to kind of jump it a little bit there. So we want to say happy birthday to our friend Paul McGann. Woohoo! Yay! Yeah! And I believe we can safely say myself, Patty, and Mark have all interviewed Paul in some form or fashion. So yes, we've had we the have. honor to be on stage with them, all three of us, and we will do it again. No problem there. Absolutely. But, uh, Paul, happy birthday, and happy, happy birthday. birthday to Matt Smith, which his uh, birthday took in late October. So two of our doctors just recently had birthdays. Uh, so happy birthday, guys. Yeah. And see, we didn't even have to play the music for that. It was playing in my head the whole time. Consider this a PS to the news. We just recently had the release in the theaters of The Power of the Daleks for the 50th anniversary of Patrick Troughton taking the role as the Doctor. And it was spectacular. Oh, yeah. And if you're ever going to watch Doctor Who in a theater or in any setting and you want it to be the ultimate experience, watch it with Whovians who will go absolutely and completely ape nuts right. watching the series. It, it, I mean, I just saw it in my local theater, and it was wonderful. If you did not get to the theater on Monday, starting this Saturday at 8.25, episode one will be on BBC America, and they'll be showing it in weekly installments for six weeks. Wait. So Doctor Who is back on BBC America. In its own so happy. Classic, classic. Classic Doctor, Doctor Who, yeah. yeah. Uh, the DVD for Power of the Daleks in England comes out Next Monday, the 21st, I've got my order in. It'll be delivered from Amazon.co.uk, so I'll have my own personal copy. They'll also be releasing a color version of it on Blu-ray at the end of December 
in England, and at the beginning of January, there will be a DVD version of both the black and white and the color animated ones for America. So you can and choose that's really the one you want. if you want to watch the way it was meant to be watched in black and white, or the way that it's going to look, oh my oh. god. Or the color. way that technology meant for it to be watched, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But wait, are they fully colorizing the whole thing? They, they, they did it in both ways, yeah. They, 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 yes. I mean, did they colorize the black original black and white footage as well? Well, it, 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 there's no footage. It's all animated. It's a cartoon. So yes, it's all colorized. Oh, okay. A color all right. Version right. And a black I thought I thought there was like 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 parts of one episode or something that still existed. Well, there's uh, regeneration I kept it wrong. sequence, but okay. Yeah, they're, right. not okay. Putting cool. it, they're not putting the lot the footage that it does exist in it. They're okay. Going totally animated. All right. That would be sweet though if you could get classic Who and then colorize it and yeah. you know high definition. Ooh. I think it'd be a whole new experience. And Ted Turner is going to be involved. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why the color is going to be on Blu-ray, because it's probably going to look spectacular. And just so that you know all this, actually, you can see a, just a bit of a gif that uh, that's cycling right through. Uh, all this news is on Marku42.net. Come and visit, and also our Facebook page. And since I'm doing the news, I'm going to try to finalize it with this tagline. And that's all the news that's fit for a Hooniverse. All right. There you go. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll have Anna Van Hooft, an uh, interview with her. She was in Warcraft as she played Alonel. She was Princess Aurora in Flash Gordon on Sci-Fi. She's Yummy. been on Friends, oh, sorry. Cedar Grove. She's been on a lot of things. And we will be right back after this. <laughs> Hello, I'm Nicholas Briggs, the voice of many monsters on Doctor Who and executive producer of Big Finish Productions. And I'm pleased to announce that Mark Who 42 books have joined forces with Big Finish to bring you Big Finish Audio. There's this fellow who calls himself the Doctor and he says he has saved me and we are in his time machine. You're right. I think I've broken something. What about you? Yes, I'm fine, thanks. Mm, I rather think I broke your fall. Oh, sorry. Mark Who 42 Books will now offer to bring you the best in Big Finish audio. But why are they here? Hmm? How do you do? I beg your pardon? Oh, no need to. I'm the Doctor, and this is... I am Leela. By all means, please do come out to play, Doctor. I'm waiting for you. To find where Mark Who 42 books will be, go to markwho42.net or on their Facebook site at markwho42. What are you saying? They fizzled in somehow, like the TARDIS? Yeah, transmat from another dimension. The, the, the TARDIS doesn't fizzle. It's more of a... Also go to markwho42.net and download my interview with the team. You're executive producer at Big Finish Productions. Correct. Correct. Is this a quiz? Mark Who 42, taking you to the Hooniverse and beyond. The voice of Christian Basil, take one. Hi, I'm Christian Basil, and I would like to provide my voice for all your voiceover needs, such as... Okay, like an announcer. Like a what? Like an announcer. For all your voiceover needs, such as animation, radio, announcements, introductions... Now an old man. I can even record voicemail for all the mashuganas that call you. A pirate. Arr, and it won't cost you a lot of treasure for me services. Arr. A creepy movie voice. Just call 407-761-2679. 407-761-2679. Or email voice of Christian Basil at yahoo.com. Well, how was that? That's a wrap. Hi, folks. This is Christian Basil, Mark Who 42. And if you've been lucky enough to catch us at conventions and wondered how you could hire us to come to your convention or special event, simply go to Heroes on Hand, click the podcast icon and click the icon for mark who 42 on our page on heroes on hand you can actually click the button that says click here to book more who 42 for your next event and that's all you have to do once again if you want to hire us for your next event simply go to heroesonhand.com click on podcast click on our icon and click the green button to book us for your next event you're gonna love us we'll see you there Hello, this is Travis Ritchie. I play Inspector Space Time, and you're listening to Mark Who 42. 
Welcome back to Mark Who 42, taking you to the Hooniverse and beyond. And today we have a very, very special guest. If you are familiar with the Sci-Fi Channel's uh, Flash Gordon, or if you've seen Warcraft, you've seen her. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Miss Anna Von Hooft. How are you doing, Anna? I'm really well, really well. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Uh, we just recently had a bit of a hurricane deal down here in Florida. Just a so. little bit. Just a little, just a little, little bit of hurricane. We, uh, yeah, I, you know, just straighten up the garage and stuff like that but I, Anna for the folks who may not be familiar with your work I mentioned just a few items tell us a little bit about yourself there um well uh Flash Gordon uh which you already mentioned I played Princess Aura in the 2008 sci-fi tv series uh you were correct in mentioning Warcraft although my role in that's not huge my bragging right with that movie is that I am the first woman in the history of the world to wear the armor of the alliance which I'm I'm pretty proud of even if even if I'm well, that sounds like nothing to sneeze out there <laughs> well, I guess not. I mean, honestly, I didn't even audition for my role, so it's not like a bragging right that has to do with me doing anything extraordinary, but it was still kind of a cool experience. I could have kept that on the DM, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> they would have not, they would have not <laughs> known. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. It's kind of nice when somebody just calls you straight up with an offer and goes, hey, do you want to just do this movie? And you go, oh, yeah, sure. The biggest budgeted movie in the world? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do that if you want. What else have I done in sci-fi land? I did do an episode of Supernatural. I popped up on Arrow. Actually got to work with Alex Kingston on that. Which really? Was a little dream come true. Yeah, actually, and I didn't recognize her when I met her. We were shooting. We were in the middle of shooting a scene because she had straight hair in Arrow. Oh, okay. That, and that's... so I saw her and I, I recognized her, but I honestly just thought she must be in, like actors. Like it happens all the time where you kind of run across the same people all the time. So I just sort of assumed she was somebody in like my circle that I didn't really know. Mm -hmm. And um, we were in the middle of shooting a scene and we were actually shooting my coverage and she made a river song face. And uh, in the middle of the scene, I went, oh my God. Because <laughs> just all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, you're... You're bloody Alex. Well, how did I? Your river song. I'm such an idiot. So, yeah, there was Arrow, Supernatural. I um, also did uh, Witches of East End. A couple episodes on that, right? I did. I did three episodes of The Witches of East End. That was really fun. Playing Christian Cook's lover, who was actually also in Doctor Who. Ooh. Yeah, who was he in Doctor Who? He played, um, like, a soldier uh, for, um, like, it's the episode where the... This is, I'm not good with names of episodes. So you're going to have a lot of descriptives. There's the bus and it takes off. And then oh, they um, it, shoot it down. Planet of the Dead, yes. Yeah, he's in that. Oh, he plays a soldier in that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it was just, we were talking because he was from England and we were talking about stuff. And I was, he mentioned he was in Doctor Who and he was so nonchalant about it. And I was like, I wonder if that's like how everyone in Vancouver does Supernatural. And we're just like, oh, it's Supernatural. You know, everyone's going to do it at some point in their career, probably. He's like, yeah, Doctor Who. Like now, speaking of which, uh, being is on the he... Doctor Who podcast, uh, does uh, what is your geek cred, uh, starting with Doctor Who? Who's your doctor? Who's your dad? David Tennant. Yes. David Tennant for life. Which I feel like is the most vanilla answer one can give to that question. That's, uh, I, Isn't there, he kind of like the go-to if you started in the later series? If you start in the later series, yeah, there's a lot of people who come up to me and they go, well, my favorite doctor is David Tennant. Almost, they're like embarrassed. I'm like, well, what's wrong with that? And I'm just like, well, everybody says David Tennant. I said, no, this is the guy who made it a, a, a success. I mean, Chris brought it back, but David ran with it even harder. And everybody. Yeah, I, I liked Chris's. Problem. I know Chris gets a bad rap. I liked his. And that's where I started. I started with Chris. And then I remember when David took over, I kind of was a little resentful because I missed Chris. And then I fell so in love with David. And then yeah, I didn't like Matt for a while. And then I fell in love with Matt and. You know, that's the natural evolution of the doctor. Yeah. Unfortunately, we we fall in love and then, yeah. I feel like it's like if your parents get a new boyfriend or something like that, where you're like, I hate you and I don't want to. <laughs> Like, I'm not interested. You took daddy and I'm away. I'm going to do this anyway. Hey, that is the but. best uh, analogy that I have heard for describing the uh, the grief process of the doctor. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. 
And then like every little thing they do, you judge them for. You're like, I'm like, you're like, bow ties are stupid. And then by the end of it, you're like, I love bow ties. Bow ties are the best. I'm getting a bow tie. But it's a journey. I haven't gotten on board with Capaldi yet, though. I was about to say, I was seeing if mom walked in with Capaldi, the fangirls are going, ew, he's old. <laughs> I so loved funny. that he was old, though. I loved that. And I was so excited because I loved him in uh, The Three Musketeers. But I, I just, oh, I just, it's just, I, you know, he's too dark for me. Like, it's just too much darkness. I think I think it's, a, and this is something we've talked about in previous episodes. I think it's just not Capaldi. It's the showrunner. Yeah, and I, I don't blame Capaldi for that. I guess I guess I shouldn't say just like Capaldi. I just I want that burning rage that is just simmering below the surface, mm. and it's kind of bubbling over now. And if they take it somewhere super amazing, then I'll probably like it'll there'll that could be a great journey. But right now I'm kind of like, come on, too dark, too dark, too dark. This is my happy place. Well, we've seen we've seen it in spurts. In the first series, people are going like uh, his first series. We, people are going like, uh, no, just pretend it didn't happen. And then the second series, okay, it gets a little better because we mentioned on the show, and I, I'm I'm sincerely strong about this. I think after the first series that he had, Stephen Moffat didn't know what to do with him and just said, okay, what do you want to do? And I could see him walking into the production office with sunglasses, with the, <laughs> with the, with the sweater, with the hair back, with the, and everything with the guitar and goes, here's your doctor. <laughs> here's where it's yeah. So I think that's, I think it's finally gotten to where we're going. And you see the spurts, like uh, his speech in the Zygon inversion about war. I don't know if you've seen that yet. Which one's the Zygon inversion? Uh, it's the one with the monsters who can change their form to appear like anybody else. Oh, right. Yeah, if, yeah. You ha- if you haven't seen that, I will not blow it for you. But you've got to stick around for that ending. It's a two-parter. It's Zygon invasion, Zygon inversion. And you got to stick around for his ending. And you will go, oh, my God, where has he been? Where has this doctor been? Why haven't they been writing like this since I, the very beginning. So. I think, I mean, like, this is true of any actor who takes on a TV series and it's hard. Like, I, I think playing the role of the Doctor would be one of the most intimidating roles you could ever possibly take on because there is sort of a legacy that you have to follow. I had this when I did Princess Aura. I was, what, the eighth or something person to play Princess Aura. So you have this legacy which people expect you to respect and sort of follow through on. But a character never works until you as an actor can really own it and make it your own it's a constant negotiation between all the directors and producers and everything that you work with and writers and you because everybody has to come together to create that kind of character and it takes time it does take time to find that like simpatico kind of kismity relationship where everybody has a chance to do what they want to do and get their input and everything starts working together but it took a while with him i think I, i think they wanted to change the doctor i think they wanted to do something different in a little bit newer and darker and it's taking them a while to hash it out but well, since, i'll wait well since talking about princess aura did, let's first talk about flash Gordon in the 2007 tv series how did yeah. you get that gig what did you think about well I'll, I'll break it up into three what did you think about your character and did you know about the geekdom that had started with this particular character and how i had no on? idea i had no idea whatsoever i was visiting vancouver um, I was living in LA and I was visiting Vancouver for the summer. That was the plan. And then I ended up booking this TV series called Flash Gordon playing Princess Aura. And I remember being very excited because I thought I was playing like a princess with big puff dresses. And that was my version. Uh-huh. And I texted some of my friends back home and I was like, looks like I'm not coming back to LA for a little while because I'm going to be up here shooting a show. And they're like, what's the show? And I was like, it's called Flash Gordon. And they're like, oh, enjoy your gold bikini. And I was just, <laughs> I just oh, threw no. it out. I was just like, I don't know what that means. Like, maybe that's some, like, weird L.A. lingo I haven't picked up yet. Whatever. And then I went to my first wardrobe fitting and they handed me, like, a Madonna-style cone bra that was probably, like, a foot long. Mm -hmm. Like, they ultimately had to drop it because you can't walk without those things just, like, flapping. And bedazzled underwear with a little skirt that wasn't really a skirt at all, actually. Slave Leia comes to mind. Yeah, so, exactly. So, I was like... Okay, so this is not the princess that I'm thinking of. And then I started to do some research. And I didn't see the film until halfway through shooting the series because I didn't want to have too many things going through my head because I hadn't done much at that point. I was still a pretty young actor, and I was terrified. (laughs) I was so completely terrified because I was on set with, like, Eric Johnson, who I used to watch on Smallville in high school. And I just was, like, overwhelmed with the feeling of, like, not belonging there. So I didn't want to, like, add 
pressure of seeing what other people had done with this character that I was playing. But I also wasn't anticipating the kind of fandom. I wasn't I wasn't a sci-fi fan back then at all. So that kind of community was not something I was familiar with either until the show came out. And then then I kind of realized exactly what I had gotten myself into. And I was like, oh, whoa, this is both awesome and terrifying. Well, I don't want to say terrifying, but like overwhelming. more overwhelming. Yeah, way more overwhelming than I had thought that it would be. But also with Flash Gordon, they hired me to do two to four episodes. And then they offered me a series regular role. Whoa. Shortly thereafter. Yeah, so that was nice because that, that kind of wasn't too much pressure right away. I was like two to four episodes. Okay, I can do that. And then after a while, they're like, actually, do you want to just be on our show? (laughs) And by then I was like ready and confident and felt like I knew what I was doing and had my own version of aura sort of created. But I mean, you can never recreate like I'm not Italian with an accent. You know what I mean? Like you can't ever be somebody else who played your character. So it is it is weird. It is a bit of a process knowing that people want you, they're attached to something. Like every, this is also, I feel like every doctor who comes in to play knows that like David Tennant is somehow the holy grail of doctors and that people will sort of be putting you against that version that they have in their mind. That's a lot of pressure. Uh, it, is, it is kind of a lot of pressure, I guess. And I yeah. guess not knowing how much of that history was already enveloped. Uh, yeah, and then- I'm glad now I could probably handle it, but back then I'm glad I didn't know how much history there was with Flash Gordon and 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 fandom. I mean, fandom's such a thing now. It wasn't really such a thing back then, 2007. What was it like working with the Sci-Fi Channel? Um, it was good. Like you're kind of a little, especially being up in Vancouver. You're a little like every now and then some sort of like delicate would come and visit set. There's so much sci-fi up here that it's kind of its own little community. I mean, Supernatural up here, the Stargates were all up here. Right. Um, so it's just such a big part of the film community as a whole. The channel kind of just, I feel like they just let us run our own stuff. <laughs> They're just kind of like, dude, you guys, you guys have been doing sci-fi for so long, you know. And ironically, Doctor Who was filmed in Vancouver. The TV movie was filmed out there. What? Are you serious? Yeah, that's serious. I think, if, and correct me if I'm what? wrong, it's the one and only time that Doctor Who was not filmed in London, or at least in Europe. It was not BBC oh. related. It was Universal who picked it up. And... Uh, um, they filmed it in Vancouver. It's the only time that it was it, it was outside of its Did element. They film in like uh, Nevada or Texas for a little while when they did the whole astronaut bit. Yeah, I, I think they did, but, but it was still part of the BBC. It was still kind of owned oh, and operated it's not by BBC. them. Mm. It, 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 the I believe if uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not familiar with how the company worked out there. I think Universal bought the rights to film it because what Universal was going yeah. to do was bring it to America and they were going to reboot it here. But instead of rebooting it, they actually extended it. So they put in Paul McGann, the Eighth Doctor, but they filmed it in Vancouver. In fact, the gentleman who plays the companion, Yi Ji Cho, who plays Chan Li, he lives in Vancouver and he actually wrote a book taking pictures of all the areas that were filmed in Vancouver for that one tv movie i had no idea the more you know (laughs) the more you know that's really interesting exactly i mean so much stuff gets filmed up here there's times when you're watching a movie this happens a lot i'll watch a movie and i'll be like oh i know this i know you know because you just so much stuff gets filmed Mm -hmm. part of the last pirates Mm -hmm. of the caribbean just was just finished filming up here yeah i just saw the trailer for the new movie that is correct absolutely uh so Miss Anna. Yeah. On behalf of all the Warcraft people out there, I'm (laughs) going to have to intervene here. Um, Okay. I won't make it too terribly difficult. Uh, It is my understanding that Aloman was the role that you played. Yeah. Okay. And um, that is actually uh, not found in the World of Warcraft lore. And um, the explanation I can best come up with is that in the game, I mean, you can easily get away with naming a bunch of random characters. Stormwind, Doc, uh, Guardian, or whatever. But in a movie, that doesn't work out so well. So you have to. All right. So we got to be very careful who we use here. Let's give some names. So, I, to my understanding, this is a name that came up strictly for production. But I am more yeah. curious as to your perspective 
in being there and being part of that movie and just how the experience was for you being part of that production? It's really interesting when you do bigger budgeted movies like Warcraft was. Uh, they're so shrouded in secrecy. So I auditioned for Warcraft, I believe, for Paula Patton's role, but I'm not actually sure because they wouldn't release the script. They weren't calling it Warcraft. Like everybody knew what it was, but nobody was supposed to. So um, it kind of went under an alias and I was auditioning for a goblin queen mm. um, with sides that weren't from Warcraft. So it's it's all very, very sort of secretive. So even when they called and they said you put the role of Alaman, I was like, who's Alaman? Like, I don't <laughs> I auditioned for Goblin Queen. But everything is so planned out. For example, in this movie that I just finished shooting last week, we would shoot maybe 12 pages a day. So 12 pages of scripts. There were days on Warcraft where we would shoot one eighth of a page all day. Oh, wow. So you could spend all day on a horse taking two steps forward, a bunch of people talk, taking two steps back, taking two steps forward, letting people talk, taking two steps back, taking, you know, like all day long. You could just do that, do that, do that, do that. Sounds exhausting. <laughs> it's tedious because I'm used to working, I mean, Flash Gordon, my average was 16 a day, maybe 16 pages. So you're doing 16 hour days, but you're, you're like, it's like, don't walk, run all day. And I love that. And so to go to like the little tea tediousness of having to work with like 30 horses in a scene well so much can go wrong you know one of the horses decides to take a piss you have to retake the scene you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like something that you're constantly battling but it was really it was it was a really good experience too the story with alaman so alaman was actually written as a man which is why i didn't audition for alaman or one of the reasons why i did audition for alaman alaman was written as a man he was a commander of a legion so uh, if you do see the movie there was three of us who commanded legions and you can sort of the other two are a little bit more visible um although they whittled the movie down a lot yes uh, from what it was they edited out whole storylines and everything like that but the other two are a little bit more visible but um duncan jones our director it's my understanding this was partly his decision uh said that he wanted a woman in the armor he wanted a woman to fight for the alliance because in the game they're all men but he's like we have women players they should be represented now that we're not just stuck to some sort of avatar we can put whoever we want in these suits so they called me up and offered me the role and i said yeah of course and i went to my fitting <laughs> And uh, it was it was amazing. Like, it's this epic warehouse. Um, Weta had made all of our armor. So it's all this beautiful armor that was made. The same people who did all the armor for um, Lord of the Rings. But it had all been made for men already. So they had to fit me into that armor. So there were certain things I couldn't do. Like, I could never take my chest plate off because they had to jerry-rig my chain mail to kind of try to fit it all inside and put a lining in because you could see right through my chest plate because oh. it made for somebody with a much with with a big oh chest <laughs> not a like wafy female and they and the George to Casey and say is going oh my <laughs> <laughs> So it was, it was, there was a lot of, of, of sort of like adjusting It's just same like the armor weighs about 50 pounds. And if you're putting that on a 230 pound guy, it's not as big of a deal when you're putting that on a 110 pound female, it's a lot to lug around every day. <laughs> it was fun, but learning how to, to ride horses and learning how to fight with swords when you're wearing almost half of your weight on your back, that was such a challenge that I think sometimes shooting an eighth of a page, you're so distracted with like every little movement became not only like a fight, but like every little movement required so much effort to make look deliberate when you're kind of confined in all that armor. It's cool though. I wish I had more photos of myself in that armor. I yeah, just see this that's... little image of like Yosemite, uh, no, Wiley Coyote when he's been flattened down, all you see is this chainmail and two feet moving about and going, okay, what am I doing now? What's my motivation? That actually happened too because all of our background performers had to wear the armor as well. But if you fall down in that, you can't get back up because you don't have the range of motion. Like even if you're strong enough to, to hoist yourself up, you don't have the range of motion wearing all of that. So there was the rule when we were, they had to implement when we were doing fight scenes because if we were doing fight scenes and you tripped and you fell, people would try to get up. So you'd have like kind of that. You'd have this like lunk of metal on the ground with all these kicking arms 
within feet of these people trying to get up. So they inserted a rule that was, if you're fighting and you fall, you're dead. You just die. We'll insert something later. We'll... <laughs> CGI and arrow, but we can't have a field of like squirming metal fish. <laughs> I mean, on top of that, the horse pees on you. So it's just over. uh, overturned metal turtles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. It was it was kind of like that. Yeah, and the horses too. I mean, in a sense, that's really good because I mean, there's a lot of um, you know kind of playful banter going around as as far as how authentic they went with this movie, and there's also the talk about the city of Stormwind and apparently how majestic and breathtaking taking it was and <laughs> so I, I suppose, you know, with the female gaming community, we all kind of turn up our noses a little bit because the men get this wonderful, extravagant metal chain yeah. and stuff. And then you get, here's a metal bikini. Um, it actually yeah. has as many <laughs> points as his. Um, but here, enjoy that. <laughs> you know, so that's Yeah, it's true. <laughs> if I'm going to die, I wouldn't mind if a bunch of slave layers come storming my house. <laughs> I think I'd be cool yeah, with that. Yeah, but it's like, it, it's, you start off with like all these rags and garments and, and and stuff, and then all of a sudden it's like you're max level with your skimpy bikini. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I totally get that. But I mean, you saw the movie. What did you think? How how sort of uh, bang on to the uh, to the game did you think it was? Uh, well, obviously Warcraft is not correlated to World of Warcraft because that's what. Yeah. Warcraft became. So it's like the very budding seed that is World of Warcraft today. And um, I was a little bit frustrated with the, I guess, the reviews that were coming out of it because um, they weren't looked at from the nerd and geek fandom. No, right? they weren't. It was a critical failure. We all kind of, we can all sort of acknowledge that. You're right. So here's, here's an interesting thing, though, because Duncan Jones was a huge Warcraft fan. If you go, like I went to the premiere in L.A., we had two theaters at the Chinese Groman Theater, Duncan didn't come talk to us. He went to the theater for the fans and he talked to them instead, which is a little unorthodox. But I think that was really... I, I didn't mind that it was a critical failure because it was... Sp- Supposed to be made for people who were Warcraft fans. It wasn't supposed to be just a big budget, flashy action film. Right. It was supposed to be more for the fans, less for the critics. Yeah, so it kind of that, that kind came of across. Where a bunch of conversation comes out from that, which is like, okay, well then, what are movies? Period. Trying to do, you know, because movies in general, I mean, you have a target demographic and you have your entertainment that you're trying to put out there. But you know, it, it really did seem there for a minute that it's like, oh well, I guess we have nothing. To our opinion has nothing to do with this. It's just about the critics. And we never, we, none of us really agreed that they should have gotten such a low rating on that because me personally, I was completely astounded. You know, I thought that <laughs> as far as the lore is concerned, you know, Duncan did very well. I mean, because there's only so much you can do with a movie and all these hours and hours and hours and hours yeah. and hours of content with a video game. But yeah. I thought that he did a remarkable job. It was absolutely beautiful the way that it was filmed. Um, it's it was breathtaking. And so for me to go from a video game to turn around and go, oh, my God, they turned it into a movie. You know, there was I was kind of holding my breath a little bit like, ah, how is this going to be? Because then they would yeah, kill Yeah, it's him. scary, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I can only imagine, though, but World of Warcraft, I think, has a bright future ahead. And the key thing is if you're going to have people producing and directing these movies, they need to know they need to be a fan, too, in order to make it good. And Duncan was, which is great. I don't know if they're going to do a sequel or not. I kind of hope if they do, I don't know who will direct it necessarily. If they do, I hope it is another another fan. Because here's like the sad fact that nobody wants to think about when it comes to movies. The goal of movies is to make money they're businesses yep so you've got on one hand the creatives and then on the other hand you've got the business people and there is like a constant dialogue between the two of like making something that will sell which is where you end up sort of like losing the lore sometimes because they're like well we want a broader audience right right and they did that with like harry potter and lord of the rings it's like ah yeah, you know, but exactly. what if we had it explosions to get michael bay in here and exactly really now. <laughs> things that sell can we add um some sex and some explosions you know explode the bikini <laughs> off of her Perfect. Yeah. Put that into production. Good. Done. Exactly. You know, and it's like, all right, cool. You know, so it's, I don't know, when it comes to video games like comic books or like, you know, a comic book to a movie, a book to a movie, video game to movie, there's a lot 
that it's going to get thrown out. And it's a lot that's going to piss off the fans a little bit because it's kind of insulting for us to kind of put all this effort and follow. And yeah. all of a sudden, it's, what is this? And you're not going to make everyone happy. That's the reality going mm-hmm. in, that anytime mm-hmm. you do sort of a recreation of something that somebody loves, everybody's got their own interpretation. You're not going to make everyone happy. And you can't you can't even try, really. Well, especially with the nerds. The nerds are the worst. You know, we're never wrong. We are passionate. <laughs> you know all the facts. And um, if you disagree with me, I will troll you till you log off. You rage quit. <laughs> and, and correct me if I'm wrong over here. With a video game or even a book, and I wasn't a big Warcraft. I'm more of a Starcraft. Mm-hmm. You have an investment because you're part of the story. You are a character in the story. And you're spending hours yeah. for the most part where a movie only has maybe at best 90 minutes to two hours you don't have that vested commitment as you would when you're sitting at home and you're part of the story and you're engaged in it you can't really do that to up to a movie it's true and that's something that we did say on warcraft 2 is like this isn't really our story this is the story of a lot of people because a lot of people interact with it on a regular basis with these characters and this kind of mythos and all that kind of stuff and that is intimidating it is because it's kind of it's kind of like when there's a new doctor there's people who just don't want to like exactly. you and you're not going to make everyone happy but you kind of honestly you think about that a little bit while you're filming but your day to day is kind of so involved with getting your shots done <laughs> That it's more kind of this like thing that you just you're just holding your breath until the movie comes out and then you're you kind of, you know, you get the gamut of reviews always. I'll put another movie out there that I was looking forward to. And as funny as it sounds, I thought The Rock was a perfect lead for this movie and hearing what they were going to do with it. I grew up with this video game. It was Doom. Uh, And when I saw the movie, yeah, when I saw the movie, I'm like, did you even watch the video (laughs) game? Did you even spend two minutes on the game? Because I don't know what this is. This is a movie that is completely... But I can see where it's coming from, too. You, you, you just when when you have that heart and soul and that geekdom in there, it, it is hard to convert it to a movie yeah. and, and try to get it out there because you're trying to tell a story. And and I'm sure you, it, it's a wonderful story. It's just that they're looking for the nitpick de- de- details like I was. I was like, OK, where are we playing the video game? And the lead character well, I'm going to spoil it for everybody, dies. And I'm just like, okay, that never happened in the video game unless, you know, he gets respawned every every time. I'm like, that's the whole yeah. point of the video game. He dies, but he doesn't come back. I'm like, okay, that kind of blew the purpose of this whole genre. But I'm just like, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. That You can't satisfy everybody. You're trying to tell a story, and you're hoping that people will adapt to the story that you're trying to tell. Well, the worst yeah. thing that they can do is, you know, you take a book or you take a video game or whatnot, and if you legitimately take that content and decide to go, I'm going to make something off of this rather than using the book or the video game as, like, guidelines, basically, almost like an outline, like, ah, that's the idea, but we're going to go this way with it. See, that's when we all, like, that's when the, the fandom kind of gets pits. He's going to get mad. Yeah, but then when it works, sometimes it works so well. Like Battlestar Galactica, um, campy, campy movie. Mm-hmm. And then they made it into a drama and people loved it, you know? Oh, no, you're right. I mean, that and was... The interpretation was everything. And I know, like, Flash Gordon, we struggled with that a lot because we yeah. were like, wait. Because Battlestar Galactica was huge at the time. And it was the biggest, it was sci-fi's biggest show. So there was this conversation that we were always having being like, well, are we going to try to do the campy sort of Flash Gordon of Sam Jones? Or are we going to try and do the Battlestar Galactica thing where we take something super bizarre and we play it as a hard drama, like where we like really invest, like we mean what we yeah, say. See, and that will work. That will work, you know. And then one of the re- reasons why I was so sketchy about the um, Warcraft movie was because in my mind, I'm like, in order for you to get the lore and to get this right, it'd be better suited as a as, as a TV show. You know, because at that point you can take it step by step and really you don't have to pick and choose so much. Yeah, you can incorporate a lot more into that and not have to sit here. Okay, well, we gotta have you gotta have to cut that out because we can't do an eight-hour movie. We gotta we can only have this much and we gotta do this. We gotta do that. You know. And so when I did see the movie, I was like, you know what, Touche, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I mean, obviously, there's always going to be negative feedback, but 
usually I reserve those because I'm not a director. I've never had to direct anything. And I'm sure that if I was in that position, I would have done a horrible job. <laughs> Awful. I, I mean, somewhere in between that, I would have just called somebody up and be like, okay, so this was all a really bad idea. I don't know what got into me. <laughs> just cancel the whole thing. I quit. There's yeah. Well, there's directors and then there's also producers yep. and producers have a creative hand as well of, you know, they're the ones who sort of dictate what they want made. And a director's job is to try to bring that about to right. a certain extent. So let's uh, deviate from this because otherwise we're going to be on, on Warcraft. Yes, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have, like I like I mentioned prior, um, I did some mild stalking on you. Very mild. Yes. Uh, on me? Uh, no, honey. Oh, Anna. That one, was severe. <laughs> that one was severe. On Anna, I was mild about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, I got to start off slow and then you crank it I was up. I was wondering where the camera came from <laughs> Uh, but and yeah, I mean, takes. I noticed that you were um, you were on Fringe as uh, Nina's assistant. Yes, you were also on the uh, on on CSI on an episode called "I Like to Watch Giggity." <laughs> yep. Um, Supernatural, you uh, in 2013, you were Artemis. Yes, I was. Arrow, you were Jen, and you were on Witches of East End as Carolyn. So you have been kind of all over the place, sprinkling your awesomeness here and there all over the place. So you have a nice resume going on. But I also noticed that most of those roles have been kind of small, very humble roles, and that you have an up-and-coming role in the movie Crash Pad that is actually in post-production right now, set to come out next year. Yeah. And that's looking like a bigger role, because when I looked on IMDb, you are fifth from the list. You're going to be playing Samantha. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, I can tell you. It's not actually a huge role. Um, it's it's one of the smaller roles that I've done. But Crash Pad is is a movie with Thomas Hayden Church and Donald Gleason. Those are the two that I play with. And it's kind of a dark, was well, not kind of, it's a dark comedy, which was... That year, I had done four movies in a TV series and Crash Pad. Uh, so it was a really busy year, but Crash Pad was my favorite thing that I did all year, uh, despite being my smallest role all year. Just because Domino Gleason is, in my mind, one of the sort of like the most brilliant actors I've ever worked with. He is, for those who don't know, to give him a face, he was in About Time or in Ex Machina. He was in Star Wars. Um, he's... He, Irish Irish ginger but just watching him work was one of the most fascinating things that happened to me in a long time <laughs> and I didn't know who he was actually and until I worked with him and then I started watching his stuff and I was like damn man you're good yeah so this is this has all been very exciting I mean it seems like your career is just kind of building just little baby steps but it's been building and building and building it's nice to I mean any actor sort of dream is not having to have a serving job and I haven't had to have one for quite a few years now so Woo even though sometimes you're making you know movies of the week and stuff like that that's you know like not real shiny material it's fun like even if I'm playing like somebody who kills people and steals babies that can be every bit as fun as playing like Artemis, you know, the goddess of the hunt on Supernatural. Like there's fun in any role, really. And I mean that quite sincerely. I know that's like such an actor thing to say. <laughs> well, it's actually I mean, I mean, I was looking down through your IMDb history and, you know, I was kind of thinking to myself while I'm, you know, obviously doing my stalking and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> whatever. Uh, I know where you live, and uh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, oh boy, I'm looking at it. Come I'm on, like, man, all these... How do you know where she lives? I can't find today, it. Iggy. <laughs> it's a nice couch you're sitting on. Is that suede? Anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was looking at this, and I'm like, oh my god, these are such fun roles. Like, I, I kind of like can't help but to put myself in that position. I'm like, what, what if I had this role? And and it's just, I remember seeing because, of course, the first thing I do, I'm like. I got to go on Netflix. Which episode was this? Artemis. Oh, there she is. And I'm like, God, that would be so much fun. And just, I wonder what it's like. And, you know, but I'm, I'm but a humble pirate sitting at home cleaning well, I think, and, and that's most of the time because actors, 80% of the time, I'm at home reading scripts. Like I have, I have, it is Thanksgiving weekend here in Canada this weekend. And I am spending the rest of the day when we're done here reading scripts to prepare for a bunch of auditions I have on Tuesday. So most of the time, that is actually what it's like being an actor is you're at home reading things. But it's like, like, 
it's all the rant. The most fun is the most random things that happen to you as an actor, like Supernatural. They gave me 20 minutes to learn how to shoot a bow and arrow. I had no idea how to hold one. I had no idea how to shoot them. I had no idea how to do any of that. So they were like, here is your coach. Here is a bow and arrow. Here is a tiny little room. Don't kill yourself. You've got 20 minutes and then we're going to start shooting, learn how to shoot a bow and arrow. And you're like, all right. Or if it's learning how to speak Mandarin for arrow. And they're like, it's your it's, you know, not a lot, but you got to learn how to speak some Mandarin or if it's learning how to ride horses uh, for Warcraft. It's all those little things that you kind of go like, how did I get here? <laughs> how am I, you know, you know, Princess Aura, how am I like trying to actually legitimately figure out what it's like to be the princess of a planet? You know, these bizarre sort of situations that you find yourself in. So it's the best. So what you're saying is in the next three three projects, you're going to have mad ninja skills out there. Well, actually, it's on the so world. There's a, I'm not sure when it, the next one of the next movies I have coming out is actually the Marine Five, uh-huh. which is a WWE movie with Mike the Miz, oh. um, which I got to work with a bunch of wrestlers. And I can say I've never been so bloody in my life, which was awesome because girls never get to play those roles where you're either getting beat up or beating people up. And there was plenty of times where I'd like come home at like five o'clock in the morning covered in blood and like run into my landlord and they actually have no idea I'm an actor. Um, I'd be like, hey, man. <laughs> That's preparing you for The Walking Dead then, I guess. You know, yeah, it's, 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 so yeah, when you can do those like ninja skill things, honestly, that is my favorite. If I could do action movies for life, I would. Action and sci-fi. All right, so I'll get you in touch with Michael Bay. Uh, you <laughs> might have to wear a bikini okay. and it might involve some skimpy explosions, but we might be able to but make hey, this work. <laughs> it'll sell, right? Is that the lesson that we've all learned? Are you talking to Anna or me? Uh, well, I was actually talking <laughs> to Christian about the bikini, but the explosions uh. is going to be all Anna. Yeah, Christian, if we could put you in a bikini and explode it off you, I'm pretty sure She's lots of... come in and rescue you. Here all right, go. but after Shit. three films... All right. in a horse, okay? With a, a bow horse. and arrow... That pees on me. Yeah. <laughs> With explosions at the back. You know what? Let's incorporate all of them. Nice. Put them all together. And, you know, here's the plot twist. It was all an Old Spice commercial. I'll save you in Andrew. <laughs> Going back yeah, we need a female version of the Old Spice Man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just gentlemen. Look at your girl, then back at me, then back at your girl, then back at me. Sadly, <laughs> she is not me, but she can smell like me. Explosion. All right. My horse is king. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My horse is bedazzled. So, actually, Anna, when did you get bit by the acting bug? And you said you weren't a, uh, a fan of sci-fi fantasy when you first started out here. What finally oh. turned you over to the dark side? Um, okay. Uh, well, to start, I started, uh, well, when I was little, I wanted to be a ballerina. This is just real basic like that. And then I realized that I loved the stage, but I didn't love ballet. Ballet is the military of the arts. So I realized I wanted something more creative, but I liked performing, which was amazing because I was and I'm still one of the shyest people I've ever met. So it was never really a love of the limelight. It was always a love of stories and books. I mean, my house is, I mean, Iggy's apparently creeping me right now. She can tell you covered in books um, <laughs> Lots of and stories and, and all of that. So I got into musical theater. That's how I got into acting. And actually, I never intended to leave musical theater. It kind of just happened sort of to me, I guess. I just sort of ended up making movies and then falling in love with that sort of by accident. And then after I did Flash Gordon, I had to do do all these press junkets where it would be people asking me about what I was interested in. So there, if you're doing a sci-fi show, people want to know what kind of sci-fi you're into. So I set out to go find something that I could give as an answer. And I love fantasy. I didn't really consider that to be sci-fi at the time. I didn't quite understand the relationship, but my top three favorite movies are Legend, Princess Bride, and Labyrinth. Sweet! That's, that's pretty fantasy. That's pretty much the geekdom right there, movies. That's how it all starts. Mm-hmm. But I, I thought I needed something with spaceships in it. And then um, a friend of mine introduced me to Flash Gordon, and I think I watched the first three seasons. No, the first two. The third, wasn't, third one wasn't out yet in, like, three weeks. Like, every spare moment I had, like, I couldn't get enough. And then I was like, oh, this is this is like my gateway. This is my gateway drug into the whole sort of sci-fi world. And um, and then after that, yeah. So it was it's 
It was, I'm still not like a, I'm still not a Trekkie. I like Star Wars, don't love it, can take it or leave it. But Doctor Who was kind of, it's, it's, I've never seen anything quite like that. So that was kind of what, that was my end. We, we, we can forego everybody else. That, that, that's all, that's all. That's all <laughs> well, I can understand a lot of what you're talking about too. Cause I mean, I did also start out with ballet and um, I hated it. I'll be perfectly honest <laughs> with you. My mom loved it. I hated it. Left lower, left lower, left lower. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. But I did enjoy performing though. And, you know, dancing was never my thing unless we're talking about radio on in my kitchen and I got a broom and nobody's watching. (laughs) But, you know, from that, I somehow found my way into a, you know, a stage in California to do stand up comedy. And then now that's my thing. So, yeah, I I do understand that. You know, just one thing leads to another. um, And there's a lot of trial and error in there. But. Um, you're definitely a very fascinating person. I love your personality. You're very spunky and out there. So it makes you very relatable into the sense that, you know, not all actors are like, ooh, big and scary. They're just people in a job. <laughs> hey, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not trying to flip my own bill here, but um, if America's Got Talent could ever film me in my shower, I am like audibly soundly. You're perfect. banging? I'm banging. Oh, oh man, yeah. if if I could have a camera following me around with my girlfriends, my relationship with my spouse, the way that I'm mother, I would have a hit TV series right now. Right now. It would be And you know the <laughs> ir- the ironic part is that not me. I would I'm like <laughs> in my day-to-day life pretty pretty boring to be honest. My reality show would be lame just be me on my couch reading things you know what's funny though because usually i get that a lot um with people like i I get people ask me like what you know what do you do at home all day i'm like to be honest i don't even know so it would be good to have a (laughs) camera around like oh okay that's what i did (laughs) that's what i'm doing (laughs) you know and then telling people that i'm shy and they're like what no you're not no, you're not. That's a big misconception because, I mean, I clearly know quite a few actors at this point. A lot of us are very shy. A lot. It's a very common thing with actors to be really shy. Oh, it's like, it's just, I get up on the stage, man, and I'm just like, what am I doing with my life right now? You do stand-up comedy. That's terrifying. It See, is. Oh, my God. People, <laughs> people tell me what to wear, where to stand, and what to say. So <laughs> the guesswork is really taken kind of out of it for me, you know? Mm-hmm. But the idea of being put on the spot and being like, okay, here's a live audience and go. I couldn't do that. Yeah, no. Uh, and then you got hecklers as well. So you just kind of, mm-hmm. I hope for hecklers, honestly. I'm just like, and I'm going to use you. Good. Let's do this. Well, wait a minute. The the first meeting that Anna and I had together was, and was this your first convention? Uh, no, first convention? it wasn't my first convention. Uh, second, second, second convention. Uh, okay. third, third. So I know that you and Charles Watson are now on the con circuit. Charles Watson of Con Artists, uh, Florida. Uh, Florida Con Artists. Florida Con yeah. Artists. Um, Charles does them all the time. I've had to cancel a few due to filming things, but when I can sneak them in, I enjoy them way more than I thought I would. They are kind of exhausting. Like it's a really intense weekend yeah (laughs) always uh but they're they're i get fan mail so you get to read what people think about the stuff that you've done but it's a much much more different when people come up to you and they're like i watched you in this this is what it meant to me you know i didn't really think anyone would have cared about anything that i did so it was really it's really kind of touching if not totally bizarre when um people interact with you on that level well um well my favorite doctor the fourth doctor tom baker he he expresses fan love. He talks about it a lot, and he said there's no nothing like it, and fan love doesn't divorce you. Fan love will be there till the very end, and when we go... And- as you mentioned, I don't know, you know, everybody thinks, hey, we only go up there for one hour and then we're done. And I said, no, there are some conventions we're up there for five hours. I mean, it's a workout, as I put it. Yes. Tell me if I'm wrong, Anna. It's like walking a theme park from beginning to end, from opening to close. That's so perfect. It is. That, and it's just like when you see the people leaving the theme park, they look like zombies and they're about to collapse. And, you know, if they could literally find a corner of the concrete that's comfortable, you would just fall right there. And I said, that's but it's like you guys just go out there for a couple hours. I said, no, we're out there for a couple of hours, but you don't know the other stuff that we're doing that we're not. Yeah, it's super true. And there's always kind of like, like I love because I do a lot of conventions in Florida. I kind of love my 12 hour plane ride home because <laughs> for about for a chunk of time, all you do is you just have to sit there and you kind of need to like decompress. It's kind of like putting a tiny little pin into like a blown up ball. And it's like, <sighs> 
Because there's so many, you meet so many people and there's so many experiences happening all the time. You don't really get a chance to absorb everything that's going on um, because it's almost happening to you the whole time. And it's incredible. But it is, yeah, it is like walking a theme park from beginning to end. No matter how much you love it, by the end of it, it's it's a lot. And the fan love is also keeps you going because, and and correct me if I'm wrong on this, there are people who will actually, and I won't even notice it, will actually spend an hour just standing there and talk about episodes or talk about what I said on the last episode or, or say something and I'm just like, you listen to this? You actually uh, you actually turn us on? And they go, yeah, we love it, man. I got on my iTunes and everything. So uh, tell me if I'm wrong. When you have that kind of geek, it keeps you going and that's the kind of stuff we love about going over there. I, I like spending an hour with that one person who comes out over here and says, I, I want to talk to you about what you said and we kick out. I'll give a shout out to one of my super fans. Um, there's this man, Thomas, who comes to most of my conventions and he flies out to Florida just to come hang for a couple days and he'll write down lists of questions, you know, when he's at home and then he'll come to my next convention and ask me about them and it's an interesting, it's an interesting experience because when I'm at work I don't, I don't actually think about people watching anything that I do. So when you kind of go to a convention and people want to talk to you about it and you realize that it means something to someone, it is kind of bizarre and then I kind of go back to like well that's like me and Doctor Who, you're like oh, right. Like, this is like a part of people's lives. And I forget that all the time. So conventions are a way to sort of bring me back to um, this is why we do it. And and it is actually, it's leaving your day-to-day experience and going out into the world and interacting with other people. Your work is. So it's kind of magical in that way. Okay, Anna, is there any projects or anything that you got coming up that you would like our fans and listeners to know about? Um, The three things in the next year that should be coming out are Crash Pad, which we um, briefly mentioned with with Domino Gleason and Thomas Hayden Church. We also have the Marine Five with Mike the Miz, which I'm really excited about. That's kind of the one I'm most excited to see this year. And then also there will be a Lifetime Movie of the Week coming out at some point called My Baby Gone, which you can look out for. <laughs> Working title. It might change. It's changed before. It might change again, but currently, My Baby Gone. I just imagine a very ethnic woman. My Baby Gone. It's not. We're all very white in the movie, so <laughs> I remember when it changed. I was like, that an interesting decision um i didn't make it but yeah <laughs> my baby gone oh no it's a pregnancy horror oh god no 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 no, <laughs> oh, that's no, no. Not for you right now Iggy. don't watch don't watch no we're not watching that one <laughs> <laughs> Like Rosemary's Baby or Walking Around with a Pregnancy Horror? Um, Like Walking Around with a Pregnancy mm-hmm. Horror. Oh. Kind of, kind of. I'm the horror part. Oh, okay. So that is fun. This is interesting. And where could people find you on the web? I know you have an IMDb page. Uh, yes, IMDb. I think it's backslash Anna Van Hoft, V-A-N-H-O-O-F-T. Um, you can find me on Twitter, same Twitter, Anna Van Hoft. Um, the one that I use most is Instagram. My handle is Nana Hoft, N-A-N-A-H-O-O-F-T. And there is a Facebook site you guys can also join, which admittedly I do almost nothing to. But I do answer my mail on there at some point. So mm-hmm. if anyone wants to get in touch with me there, they can do that as well. Well, Anna, thank you so much. Thanks to the both of you. It's Thanksgiving in Canada this weekend. So um, I know it's not to you, but from all of us in Canada, happy Thanksgiving. Yay. Oh, send me a turkey. Hi, I'm making pie. Want a pie? Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'll send you a pie. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. Great job, uh, guys. Christian and Iggy did a great thank job. You. Thank you. It was a yeah. pleasure. Now I have to go out and see Warcraft because I haven't seen it. I haven't it's seen beautiful, but right. I mean, if you're not a Warcraft fan, you're probably going to criticize it like <laughs> every other freaking person did out there. But that's cool. You know, you're entitled to your opinion. Well, hold on. I, I did just let me just ask this real quick because I, I, I yeah, I'd heard that if you weren't familiar with Warcraft, uh, you weren't going to get a glom onto it. Uh, so. But by Warcraft fan standards, it, it passes the, the test? The reason that it passes for us is because the biggest thing about this game, because I, I play World of Warcraft as well, and it's the lore. The lore okay. of it all. That's the whole point that you're doing this whole MMO is you're, doing, you're going through a story, and the whole point is it leads you up to the Legion, the bad guys. you got to defeat them. And uh-huh. there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of people that go are involved in it. You work with them 
they die and it's awful and whatever. So to see the beginnings of it in front of you and you actually get to see these these uh, cities that you actually get to travel into and you know, it's on TV now and I'm like, oh my God, that's Stormwind, but I'm for the Horde. But that's still really cool. And it's just, <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, as, but... as Anna mentioned, it, it's for the fans. It's really for the fans. So. All right, right on. I will. I will give it a shot then. Right. Wait, do you play World of Warcraft? No, no, but uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. And, and I'm not. I'm not poo pooing it at all. It's just that I have an extremely addictive personality when it comes to games, and I just know if I got into it, I would proceed with caution, darling. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would, I would quickly become that episode of South Park, and I just. I don't... <laughs> And I'm just, and I'm, I'm just being honest, and I just, my, I just can't get that. I guess can't get another addiction into my schedule. <laughs> no, I feel your, I feel your pain because I haven't played Warcraft, but I played Starcraft. Oh, yes. okay. Because yes. I was up at three a.m. and I, and and, and I, and I, I, I discussed it in the interview when you get to a certain level and you finally pass it, and then you look to your left at, and it's three a.m. in the morning. And you just pass this important level, beat this boss, or one up, whatever you did. And then you go, you know what? Five more minutes. Oh, God, <laughs> wow. yes. Yes. Well, I just want to see what it's like out there. No, no, no. And it's then not I'll... even. It's not even like that. It's just like, okay, you get done with everything, and oh my god, I'm so tired. I I acknowledge the clock. Let me empty my bags. Let me repair my armor. Exactly. Let me. Oh wait, that's a quest item. How did I not see that? Christian, do we have any conventions coming up? We do, sir. Claremont Comic Con. It's this weekend, and if you haven't bought your tickets yet, you can still buy them at the door. They're really inexpensive. They're just fifteen dollars for adults, ten dollars for kids. It's at the Claremont Performing Arts Center. Mm -hmm. It's located off the thirty-seven hundred South Highway twenty-seven in Claremont, Florida. Tickets at the door. Special features include comic book artist George Perez. Friend of Marku 42, Maria Saber, better known as Gothic Sushi. Hey. Plenty of other people who are going to be out there. If you just want to just be inspired by geekdom, don't want to spend too much, Claremont Comic Con is the place for you. Marku 42 will be out there with Marku 42 books. And if you want to geek out, Hoovian, by all means, come on out here. Yeah, we've got big finish audios for you. We've got books. We've got a couple toys. and It'll be nice. You definitely should come out and meet myself. Christian and Patty, we will be there representing and promoting Marku 42 there. So it's going to be fun. Claremont is in the middle of Central Florida. It's right by Orlando, right? Uh, west of Orlando. Uh, west, west of Orlando. Orlando. And it's a bit of a distance, but like not a, too... Is it a suburb of Orlando, or is it its own uh, thing? I would say it's its own thing. Would that be okay. right to say, Patty? I, I, it's a bit... It, it's a bit of a distance away from Central Florida. I would say a good 30, 40 minutes, depending upon what part of Orlando that you live nah, in. Nah, but... you, you hop on the right toll road, you could be there in 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's, uh, it, yeah, it's its own separate city. And um, if you need tickets or if you want further information, Claremont, C-L-E-R-M-O-N-T, ComicCon.com. Or go to our website, Marku42.net, and on the right-hand side on the sidebar, there is a pictured link. To their site. And go there too as well. Yeah. And it's sponsored by Florida Geek Scene. And I mention that only because you can listen to our show on Florida Geek Scene. You can also listen to our show on iTunes, on Google Play Podcast, on Stitcher Radio, on TuneIn. We are so many places around the net. You can just Google Marku42 and you'll find us. And speaking of which, on conventions, definitely want to look out at marku42.net and Facebook and Twitter, we're definitely going places in 2017 for a whole new line of conventions, and we're going to be visiting some old ones and some old friends. Definitely want to be on the lookout for anything that we're going to be posting, because don't be surprised if we're coming to a convention near you. So we are literally going to be going to the Hooniverse and beyond. That is correct. Yes. That is correct. And when I mean a you know, convention near you, I mean our friends who are outside of Florida. But just be on the lookout. I also want to mention thank you, Krypton Radio, for having us on your station. We love being on your channel four times a week. And if you're listening to us there and want to hear this show again, you can always go to one of the places I mentioned to download the podcast version of this show. And 
Wow, visit Marku42.net again and join the Hooniverse Army. We're on Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter. We are everywhere around the Hooniverse. Uh, Peanut Gang and Cashew Lady, would you like any final words since we're near the end of the show? Yeah, when are we going to be copywriting this Marku42 drinking game? Because uh, it's actually taking off over in my neck of the woods. Okay, uh, well... <laughs> You know, really? I, I, I did. I did get a trademark on Mark Who Forty Two. I could always get a copyright on this. We could. We could always uh, legalize. Well, what's the word? is it? Copyright? Would that be the right word? For yeah, that? it would be like it would be. Or, like we could definitely. We could definitely write up the rules and get it copyrighted. Definitely. Yeah, it has potential. It does have potential. I love this show because I get to drink. <laughs> okay. Christian, any last words? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) Patty, any last words? Uh, A big shout out to uh, my friends that uh, I met at the Tucson Comic Con uh, that I was at uh, last week. Um, How did that go? uh, very, very well. Um, great interviews with uh, with Tony Todd and uh, Casper Van Dien and um, Thunder Levin, the writer of Sharknado 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, which, <laughs> and, and, um, and I got a great, uh, yeah, just a good, good, solid guest. Uh, great, tidy little show. Um, had a wonderful, like, like sit down with the, uh, the local Doctor Who fan club out there. And uh, talked about, um, yeah, maybe doing some uh, some joint things afterwards when we go on the road. So, uh, yeah, uh, future announcement on that later on. But uh, if you are involved with a, your local Doctor Who fan club or whatever, uh, and you're not familiar with us, tune on in because uh, we might have a couple ideas we want to run by you individually. And I'll leave that cryptic remark for that. Oh, my. So we're closing this week's episode of Marku42 on that cryptic note. Until next time, Alonze! Geronimo! Really, Alonze should be when we start the show, not when we close the show. But whatever. Bye, everyone. We gotta go. Marku42 was written and presented by Mark Baumgarten, Christian Basil, Dickie Matthews, and Patty Hawkins. This episode was edited, directed, and produced by Mark Baumgarten. Visit markwho42.net where you can register and become part of the Hooniverse Army. We can be contacted by email at mark at markwho42, subject line, question mark. If you'd like a chance to be a guest on our radio show, send an email to our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. You can have Marku42 entertain at your next event or convention. Go to heroesonhand.com slash marku42. Space Coast Comics is a free monthly magazine found in over 120 locations currently throughout Brevard County, parts of Osceola, Belusia, and Indian River County in Florida, and soon to be available in Chicago. Follow them on Facebook to learn more. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. This show is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten 2016. This is Krypton Radio.